Well, welcome everyone and uh, welcome Gary Smith. Uh, Gary is a consultant and coach. I'm gonna bring Gary up on screen here. There he is. My name is Steven Goldberg of Optimist Performance and I bring you practical tips and ideas on leadership, team development and employee performance in the workplace. And today I'm really happy and excited to have with me Gary L. Smith. And uh, we're gonna talk about purpose in business and life. And uh, there's a reason behind that, which uh, Gary will explain as we discuss it. I just want to uh, give a little bit of an introduction to Gary. Uh, with the release of his latest book, Purpose Driven Achievement, Gary Smith is on a mission to help both businesses and in individuals find, activate, and execute on the achievement of their global and individual purposes in life. Gary Smith is the founder of Gary L. Smith LLC. As a businessman and entrepreneur for over 45 years, Gary's drive is to help businesses and individuals live happier, more fulfilled lives create massive impact and leave meaningful legacies. Gary is the author of several books, including his latest work, Purpose Driven Achievement, Common Sense Approach to Effectively Using Purpose, Energy Planning and Execution to Achieve Your Most Ambitious Business and Personal Dreams. Gary is a business consultant, business and personal coach, author and a professional speaker. Gary received his BS degree in manufacturing engineering and technology from Brigham Young University and his MBA in operations management from Rensselaer Polytechnic, Polytechnic Institute. Did I say that right, Rensselaer? Uh, Rensselaer, yes. Rensselaer, close. <laughs> you can learn more about Gary at www. Uh, GaryLSmith.com. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. I'm just going to bring up, I'll share my screen for a second here and bring up uh, Gary's website. And what I found very intriguing, uh, I'm Gary Smith, but enough about me. I like that. It's about you. There are two things that cause unusual stress in people's lives, lack of purpose and financial problems. I help solve both of them. So we're gonna talk a lot about that because I think, especially these days, uh, the past year, uh, people have been experiencing a lot of stress, financial stress, um, un uncertainties, uncertainties, I guess is the word, due to uh, COVID-19. You know, some businesses are thriving, others are really facing a lot of challenges. I, I think of the hospitality trade, um, you know, restaurants, gyms, all these types of businesses, movie theaters, uh, the whole entertainment travel, and hopefully that's coming back soon. But, you know, stress is something that we go through in our lives, um, depending on the situation, and often I guess, depending on how we respond to situations. So I thought it very interesting about um, this idea of purpose-driven um, focus. And I know that, you know, in my career, uh, working and coaching with businesses, often they didn't really have a purpose or they had a purpose when they started and maybe they forgot that purpose and the purpose was strictly to survive. And, uh, but once you get past survival, why are you in business or what is driving you in your life? So let's, let's talk about that. Uh, I'm just gonna change the view to uh, speaker view here. Tell me, why did you chose that as a focus for you in terms of your book and your coaching practice, coaching consulting practice? 
Well, I think, um, Stephen, first of all, thank you very much for having me on today. It's a real pleasure to get, uh, get a chance to speak with you. But I think the, there were really two things um, that really have driven me as far as purpose is concerned. One is that on an individual level, I think we've, we've created a society where people sort of drift through life. And if you ask them, you know, what do they do? They can tell you. Uh, but if you ask them the purpose behind what they do, I get a lot of deer in the headlights kinds of looks, you know, where people really haven't thought very much about it. And so they, they sort of drift through life, you know, and one of the things in the, in the writing of my book that I discovered when I, I did a, a search out on Amazon, there are 150,000 books out there that are somewhat related to finding and executing on purpose. But at the same time, when you look at the statistics, 80% of people are unhappy with their work and their careers and their personal lives. They're very, they feel that they're unfil unfulfilled and they're just not making it. Uh, and so you know, I thought we need another approach here because if there's that many books out there that are referencing purpose and 80% of the people in our country are unhappy, some, someone has missed the boat here. <laughs> Uh, and so that has really become a driving force for me. And to a point that you made earlier, Stephen, when we look at businesses, most businesses start out with a purpose, but they get so wrapped up in the day-to-day -day things that are going on, uh, and especially those that grow to be large enough to, say, become public companies, they, you know, they're really more focused on what do I need to do to uh, you know, to add value to the shareholder and stuff like that. And so it becomes much more about what are we doing to make money and how are we adding value as far as dividends and capital gains and things like that. And they lose their foundational principles. And, and that's one of the things that I've noticed in several of the companies I've worked with is that it's getting them to get back to the basics. And, and, and especially if the founders are still around, it's sitting with them and saying, why, why did you start this business in the first place? Because um, I was actually talking with a gentleman not long ago and he was saying, you know, well, we, you know, we've got to make money. You know, that's, that's the main focus of the business. And I said, can I, can I give you some input here? And he said, yeah. And I said, if you want to make money, Stop thinking about making money. Think about the value add that you have to your customers and focus on that. Focus on getting back to the basics of your business and giving your, pro your customers the products and services that they want and the money will be there, but stop focusing on money. Money at this point is not important. Uh, I mean, it, is, you know, it, it can't be that driving uh, force behind the business. You have to have, you have, to have something greater than, than that. Um, a number of years ago, it's probably 35 years ago, I met a gentleman who was a very wealthy businessman and he and I became friends and I had the opportunity one day to sit and have coffee with him. And he said, you know, when it comes to making money, he said, you, if you work hard and you're halfway smart, you can get yourself to a point in life where money is not an issue. And he said, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have enough to be able to go out and buy the whole world but you will be in a position where you're financially comfortable. You won't have to worry about your bills being paid. But he said, let me ask you a question. When you reach that point, what is it that gets you out of bed every morning? And he said, my point is, is that as you live your life, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a foundation that's bigger than money. And that's really what my drive is, is to help people and businesses get back to those basics of answering questions like, well, why are you here? Why do you exist? Why do you get up and go to work every day? What is it that you're trying to achieve? What value do you want to add? Uh, as Steve Jobs would say, what, what unique dent do you want to make in the universe? And what legacy do you want to leave? How do you want to be remembered when you're gone? So, you know, while you're uh, talking about this, um, you know, you talk about what gets you up in the morning and wanting to go and do some work. And uh, it makes me think, well, what, how closely should one's personal purpose be aligned with their business person? Let's take a business owner that had an idea to start a business. You know, in, in your experience, the alignment between the personal uh, purpose and the business purpose, what is the correlation between the two? I, I think there's a great correlation that needs to be between the two, uh, but 
many times that's not what happens. And that's why, uh, why we have dysfunctional organizations and people who are not happy with what they're doing. And I've got a great, uh, great example of that. Um, when my middle daughter was getting ready to go to graduate school, I was living in Boston, but she was coming to Connecticut to go to grad school. And we found her an apartment uh, in a building called 360 State Street. And it was a, a, a high rise building that was owned and managed by a company called the Bizzuto Management Company. And I was so impressed. They had a, a concierge, like a front desk and everything uh, in the building. And I was so impressed with the people there and the attitude that they had toward our service that literally could not be there for three months. And when I walked in the front door, whoever was on the front desk would say, hi, Mr. Smith, really good to see you again. Been a long time since I've seen you. Your daughter's in her apartment. Do you want me to let her know you're on your, on your way up? Um, and, and I thought, gee, what a, what a good model. Well, then after grad school, my daughter moved back to, uh, to Boston and she got another apartment in a, another Bizzuto building. Uh, and this one, they, Bizzuto didn't own it. They were just managing it for somebody else. But when I went in, the business model was exactly the same. And I thought, gee, this is really interesting. And then uh, my oldest daughter, who had been living in New York City, moved to Boston to be close to her sisters. And she moved into yet another Bizzuto property. And the model was the same. And one day I happened to meet the, uh, the property manager of one of these properties. And I said, OK, come clean. What, what is it that you guys are doing that allows you to do this? He said, oh, it comes directly from Tom Bizzuto, who's our CEO. She said, one of the things that he told us at one of our meetings a couple of years ago was that we are not in the property management business. We are in the hospitality business. And he said, what, I, what we do is he said, stop and think about it. He said, whenever you hire someone, what are you doing? You're hiring a resume. But when you fire someone, you're not firing the resume, you're hiring the personality. So hire the personality. Find someone who has a heart for serving other people and get them aligned with that's what we want to do. And when you begin to do that, now all of a sudden we've got a dynamic team because their focus is the same because they're wired to do that. And that worked from you know, the concierge to the property manager to the maintenance people. Uh, you know, throughout the whole organization, it permeated that way. And I think that's the power when you can get your organization in alignment you know, and it starts with, you know, it starts with the vision and the purpose that management has, and then they need to communicate that down through the organization. And then they need to go through, I guess, that weeding out process to find people who will align with that purpose and those who maybe it's better for them to work somewhere else because they're just not on the same page and help outsource those people. But it gets back to the original philosophy of get the right people on the bus and then get them in the right seats and you can build an effective organization. Yeah, well, we're aligned in that. I always talk about, uh, you know, the first step uh, to having high performance organization or employees is to make sure you have the right person in the right job. And that entails obviously a skill set, but fitting with the company. And I think that's what you're alluding to a lot is once they're clear, the ownership and management is clear on what their purpose is, on what business they're actually in, and this is a really great example, then they can really know who they need to bring in that's going to fit with their way of thinking, their values, their, uh, their purpose. That's really true. And the other thing, the other wonderful thing that comes out of that, Stephen, is that if as a leader in the organization, I understand the, the, you know, the people who are working for me and I understand where their heart is at and I understand what their individual purposes are, I can get them aligned with what the business is doing. But even more importantly than that, if I'm smart and I want to retain those people and build that loyalty in the workforce, I can help them get to where they want to be. I can help them uh, within the, the, the four walls of my company. I can help them achieve their own dreams and, and realize their own purpose. And, and so that's where the strength of the organization comes from is not just in getting the alignment, but in building the loyalty and, and having the depth of relationship with people in the company 
so that um, so that they feel good uh, not only about what they're doing but who they work with because they feel that the leadership of the company is really really cares about them and is invested in them. And not only that, it goes even beyond like you're telling a story about your daughters. I'm thinking, wow, you know what a uh, a way to build a brand because probably your daughters talk about their experience where they live with their friends. And this, you know, really builds the reputation, the brand of this uh, real estate company. And I'm sure probably your daughters, wherever they went to move, if they were looking to rent, they probably look for one of their properties. Am I, am I correct in thinking that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what they did. And another interesting aside to that, when, uh, when I wrote uh, my third book, uh, The Customer Conundrum, which was all about customer service, I highlighted the Bizzuto company uh, in okay. the book. And I told that story and I wound up, I actually sent a copy of it to one of the property managers uh, at one of the places where my daughters were living the property manager read the book, passed it on to Tom Bizzuto, who was the CEO of the company. And several months after I had given the book to the property manager, I got a handwritten letter from Tom Bizzuto, you know, saying, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I got the book, I read it, I was really impressed with it, but thank you so much for, you know, for recognizing what we're trying to accomplish. Because when our, when our, our not just the customers we have in the people who are living uh, in our buildings, but even when it goes beyond that to the families and the families are impressed by what we're doing and how we handle ourselves. You said that means the world to us because it means to me that we're fulfilling our mission. Right. And that goes even way beyond what you can buy with money, that type of a feeling, that type of a fulfillment of your purpose of, of, you know, the fact that you're contributing, you're making a difference, which is so rewarding personally. Exactly. So when we talk, about, I mean, you know, I'm going, I'm thinking back to <clears throat> what you said about 80% of people are unhappy. That's a shocking statistic. I, mean, I don't know where you got it from, but it's, you know, I mean, in a way you could say, yeah, it could be true because the world is in such a disarray. <laughs> um, but you know, so in, in a way, if so many people are dissatisfied or working without a purpose, there's a great opportunity. And if, you know, use the example of this real estate companies, because how many people or how many companies actually function that way, there's a huge gap between a company like that, that's really purpose driven and focused on that purpose. And those that are just floundering, you know, I look at it like a ship out at sea, that's kind of like, lost its direction and just being carried by the waves. There's a huge opportunity to fill that gap and find that purpose and start sailing towards the dream, towards the goals. So how do you actually help somebody? Like what are the steps somebody has to take to go from just being lost and maybe you forgot your purpose and you're just like floundering in your own problems to getting back on, on that focus, find, refinding that purpose, or maybe you never really had a clear one. How do you get help people to get that focus and start moving towards it? I like to hear how that process kind of happens. I yeah, I think that um, I think that when it comes to looking at purpose, it's a combination of things, if you will. But initially, I think what we have to do is we have to get back, and it's it's a simple process, but it's not an easy process to go back and, and start asking ourselves some fundamental questions. I mean, it's uh, things like, you know, why am I here? I mean, uh, you know, I, I often joke with people and say, God didn't put you on this earth to occupy space and suck up all the oxygen. There's got to be something more to your life than that. Let's dig in and find out what that is. And it's interesting because uh, with some of the people that I coach initially, you know, they, they want to treat a coach like an answer man. It's like, well, I don't have a purpose. Tell me what my purpose is. And it's like, you know, no, 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 you, you don't understand. As a coach, I'm not an answer man. I'm a guide. I'm the one who will sit and ask you questions and I will sort of guide the conversation until you have that aha moment of saying, oh, now I'm beginning to get things. But what I do is take people through exercises. I mean, one, one simple exercise is to uh, think about 
uh, when you die. If you could come back and be a fly on the wall at the church service after you have passed away, and you get a chance to sort of flit around the room and you hear what people are attending, who are attending the service are saying about you. And when people get up to eulogize you, what are they saying about you compared to what is it that you really would like them to say? Um, that's one way. Uh, back in 2006, um, I was a visiting professor at the Kazakh American Free University in Kazakhstan. And I taught a class there on uh, strategic planning and the kids came into class uh, with this new professor from the United States, and they thought, well, gee, we're going to be working on creating a strategic plan for a multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation. And the first assignment I gave them was to go home and write a personal mission or a personal purpose statement. And one young woman who was sitting in front of the class said, yeah, I, I don't understand why you would want us to do this. And I said, because if you can't write a purpose statement or a mission statement for a corporation of one, that being you, you have no credibility to do it for a multinational corporation that's going to influence the lives of potentially hundreds of thousands of people. And based on the economic cir circumstances in Kazakhstan at the time, uh, most of these kids came from relatively humble financial backgrounds. And so their purpose statements began to reflect that. They wanted the fancy cars and the nice home and the boat on the Mediterranean and world travel and all that sort of stuff. And I said, guys, I think we need to dig a little bit deeper here. So I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to envision yourself what you're going to look like when you're 95 years old. You know, really get a, a, a picture, a firm picture in your mind of what you're going to look like. And I said, if you have any problems with that, look at your grandparents. That's a pretty good indication of what, what it's going to be like. And I said, then I want you to get a mental and emotional picture. How are you going to feel when you're 95 years old? Are you going to be able to stand up straight? Are you going to be bent over? Are you going to be able to walk briskly? Are you just going to be shuffling along? You know, and really between the, 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 the physical picture and the emotional picture, really begin to feel that inside of you and then play out this scenario. You're on your deathbed. You haven't been out of bed in the past three months and your doctor just left your side and said you have less than 24 hours to live. With that scenario, look back on your life and ask yourself some foundational questions like, what are the things I've accomplished in life that I'm most proud of? What are the things I've uh, done in life that I'm absolutely ashamed of? How would I have lived my life differently? What kind of legacy am I leaving? Not just a legacy in money, but a legacy in relationships and things like that. And as they began to think about that, you know, I said, when you, when you start answering those questions, you begin to find the threads of who you are as a person. And you can begin now to take those threads and weave them together into the tapestry that's going to be your life. And during the, the time that we were working on that exercise, I saw a tremendous shift in their thinking from money and things to people and relationships. And all of a sudden they started thinking about life in terms of how can I make a difference? What kind of impact can I have? Uh, those types of things. And they really started coming up with some wonderful uh, purpose statements that really reflected some things that, that they could sort of hitch their wagon to and say, this, this stuff that I want to achieve here is something that's going to drive me for the rest of my life. But it takes a lot of self-discovery. Uh, you know, and for some people, it's very easy. For some people, it's extremely difficult. But once you get that, once you understand what your purpose is, and then you begin to develop a why behind that purpose and really understand not just what do I want to accomplish, but why is it so important for me to do that? It's like lighting the fuse on a rocket. Uh, it's it's going to take you places. Uh, you know, I'm int it's interesting because um, you have an engineering background and you worked as an engineer. I think you manage projects. You told me when we first spoke, um, and yet you're now talking about people, relationships as being your purpose. So, how did an engineer who tends to be more process driven, logical, uh, become more of a touchy feeling, I would say, emotional relationship coach. You know, it's an interesting transformation. Yeah, for me, it was something that, believe it or not, was completely logical. 
um, because, <laughs> uh, because that was one of the things that I noticed when, um, you know, I grew up in the manufacturing world and between engineering and operations, I spent 25 years uh, in, uh, in the manufacturing arena. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, I started off as an engineer, came up through the ranks as a project manager, was actually running engineering departments, and then transitioned to the operations side of the business and spent about 12 years running companies for other people. And initially, when I started my business, I started it with the idea of being a manufacturing consultant, because that was the world that I came from, as a world that I understood very, very well. But then as I uh, started interfacing with people outside the manufacturing world, I realized that a lot of businesses out there could benefit from basic manufacturing principles, stuff that I would consider to be 101 as far as how you build a business, how you run a business, and they were clueless. And so it became pretty easy for me to go in and look like a hero because I had that process thinking and, and, you know, and I would be able to lay out process steps for people, for people to work that made sense. But then I got to a point where I realized that in many of the situations where I was working, there really weren't process problems. They were people problems. And people are subject to processes just like everybody else. And I could reapply some of those, some of that process thinking. And that's basically what I've done in, in Purpose Driven Achievement is not just do the touchy feely stuff of how do we get to your purpose, but then once we have a purpose and we begin to set some goals around that, how do we do, how do we do the planning to say, okay, here's what I want to achieve. You know, what are the gaps between where I am and where I need to be? And what kind of plans do I have to put in place to be able to close those gaps? And, you know, how do I execute? How do I monitor execution? What do, what do I need to measure that's meaningful in order to make sure that I stay on track with the things that I'm doing? Those are all engineering principles. Uh, you know, they're, sure. they're not the touchy-feely, but it starts with the touchy-feely. And I think that just over a period of, of years of working with people, I've just got a real, gotten a real heart uh, you know, for taking the talents and gifts that I've been blessed with and, and finding ways to, to help people um, you know, help them get to where, where they want to be in life. So you go like from the uh, unconcrete stuff to turning that into something concrete that you could work towards realizing is really what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's take a small or medium-sized business with a business owner that you would work with to help them, you know, redefine their purpose and communicate that to everybody in the organization. Because I think that, um, you know, it's going back to that example, that real estate uh, management company or, or you know, uh, that company, I forget the name, uh, Rizzuto or something, what's the name? What was it? Rizzuto. Rizzuto. So, uh, once, well, first, how do you, like, working with the business owner himself, who else would you involve in defining the purpose of the company? Would, would you start working just with the business owner? Or would you work with uh, the directors or his leadership team? Yeah, it, it really is dependent upon the situation. Okay. Um, generally speaking, I would start off with the owner. And I would sit with the owner and, and I would just, uh, you know, just say, Hey, you know, how, how long you've been in business? Tell me about what, you know, tell me about what's going on in your company. How long have you been in business? You know, if you were the one who originally created the business, why, you know, what, you know, what was the real driving force behind it? You know, where did the creative ideas come from and how was the business formed and tell me about the early years of the company and sort of build up to, to where we are today. And, and the main purpose behind that is not just for me to understand what, you know, what's going on, but to get them thinking about their foundational roots of why, you know, how, how was it in the very beginning? And in some cases, you know, the owner may be second or third generation. So he's telling, you know, telling stories about his father and his grandfather and, and how they did, you know, how they did things. And I can begin to then boil that down and say, well, it, gee, it seems to me like, 
this was sort of the purposes or the purpose behind why, why your father or why you or your grandfather were doing the things that you were doing. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's really true. And I said, if I went to your senior staff here and I asked them what the purpose of this business is, would they be able to echo what you just told me? And in most cases, they say, probably not. Well, so well, why is that? I mean, why, why should your purpose and the original founding principles of this business, why should that be the best kept secret in your company? Right. And begin to explain to them the power that comes out of communicating that and say, why don't, why don't we have a meeting with your staff and give you the opportunity to get up and talk to them about the history and the founding and the purposes behind this company and begin to see who that resonates with and then say, gee, how do we develop a plan to, uh, to be able to continually execute on this purpose and get everybody in the company on board with the things that we're doing? Because when you do that, all of a sudden you move from being you know, a business that's focused on making money much more toward being a family where everybody feels that they're involved, everybody feels that they have a role to play and they understand how their role contributes to the overall well-being of the company. I don't know how many times I've walked out on manufacturing floors and talked to operators and say, well, gee, how does, how does what you do impact the company? So, uh, I don't know. I just come here and do my job. You know? And it's a shame because they're the people who are the ones who are solving the problems and making quality products all day long. Wouldn't it be nice for them to understand how they plug into the system and contribute to it? But what point, so let's say you're working with a business owner one-on-one -on -one and you help them redefine uh, that purpose. Then uh, from what it sounds like, you turn that into some form of plan with measurable objectives. At what point do you then start including uh, his management team or the management team of the business owner in that process? You know, I think that, you know, once we, once we, once the business owner and I understand what's going on, we communicate it to his staff and then we start involving them to say, okay, how does this, how does this vision or this purpose, how does it translate into your organization as your, your part of the business? What does it mean to you? And what kind of goals would you like to be creating to support the attainment of that purpose? You know, and, and how do we, so, they need to be invested in the process. It's a process of continual investing down through the organization. So it's never, um, never a dictating thing where this is the purpose of this organization and this is what I want you to do. It's this is what we're trying to achieve. Do you buy into this? Do you not buy into it? How do we go about doing this? And in some cases, people will say, you know what? The purpose of this company just doesn't resonate with me. And my response to that is, okay, well, if that's the case and, and you really don't feel comfortable with pursuing this kind of purpose, then maybe we need to you know, look at finding a way to nicely transition you out of the organization and find somebody who does resonate with that purpose. But we want people to be invested in the things that are going on because the more, more skin that they have in the game and the more they feel that they have a contribution to make and they have a say in the things that are going on, the better off it's going to be for the company. And then we work out a communications plan uh, and to be able to take that deeper and deeper and deeper in the organization. And from my standpoint, it's wonderful because one of the things I encourage organizations to do is be transparent with your employees. Um, there's still so many autocratic companies out there where the senior management team of the business is holding their cards so close to the vest and they're afraid to open up and share. In the companies that I've worked that were most successful where I was running operations, we would have monthly communications meetings with all the employees and everybody in the business knew where we were financially. They knew what we were doing in marketing. They knew what we were doing in research and development, and they knew how they played a role in the success of the business. And when you can begin to translate your purpose into those kinds of practical things, then you've got a real winner on your hands. Yeah, I think there's still a lot of uh, business owners, like you say, autocratic style companies that are afraid to uh, share too much information with their employees uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, one maybe is that if I tell them how 
we're doing financially, they're going to want more money, you know, things like that. Um, you know, I'm thinking while you're speaking, you know, one of the obstacles for people to embark on a process of purpose finding and planning is, you know, they're so inundated with problems, they think, well, I just don't have the time for that because, you know, it's like long-term planning and thinking. It's not going to bring in short-term results. Um, what do you say to that type of uh, thinking? I think that um, my initial response to something like that is, if it's that important to you, you can find the time. Right. You know, stop and think about how much time people generally waste every day. Yeah. You know, how, how much time do you spend on the golf course every week? How much time do you spend sitting in front of the boob tube, you know, uh, at night watching TV? You know, we, we don't stop and think about all of the things in life that we do that are, that are non-productive in a personal and professional way. Uh, so, and I'm not telling people that you need to take 100% of that time and focus on this. But if I'm saying, hey, can you find a few hours where you can just sort of get off by yourself and really start thinking about this? And maybe it's only two or three hours a week, but over a period of time, you know, you'll begin to get, you know, begin to get some solid ideas about what you need to be doing and, and discovering your purpose. And the thing that I find is when I get people doing that, initially they may be hesitant, but as they get into it and the creative juices start to flow, they start getting excited. And as they get excited, it's like, you know what, I need to find more time to do this because yes, it's an investment. It's not, it's no longer an expense of where I'm giving something up. It's an investment that I'm making that's going to pay huge dividends in the future. And if I can get them mentally and emotionally to make that transition from it being an expense to being an investment, then I've got them and they'll, they'll do something with it. Now, you know, there may, there's probably uh, people listening to this that uh, are not business owners, maybe they're a manager, a director of a department, uh, and maybe they, uh, what we're saying is resonating with them and, and you know, the, the company, they don't see there being a purpose for their company, but can they on their own find their own purpose and integrate that into their work uh, you know, within a company that maybe doesn't have a defined purpose. Uh, could that happen, do you think? Absolutely. Um, there, there's no reason that even if the company doesn't have a, a purpose, there's no reason that you can't have an, a, pur a purpose for the department that you run. Uh, it's just a matter of looking at it and saying, okay, if I'm managing an engineering department or managing a segment of a manufacturing operation, how do I add the greatest value to this company? Where is the greatest impact going to come from? And asking myself questions like that and then begin working with my people to say, well, who are your customers? If you're an engineering department, you know, who, who are the people within this organization that we serve? And how do we serve them better than anybody else so that our department will shine as being high quality, reliable, operating with integrity and honesty, being transparent about what we're working on, things like that. And when we start to do that, what's going to happen is that manager is going to start to stand head and shoulders above everybody else in the organization uh, because his, his department is accomplishing and his people are invested in the success of the company. And who knows, maybe the owner or one of the senior leaders of the business is going to come down and say, you know what, I don't know what it is that you're doing, but whatever it is, I like it and I want to know more about it. And you right. begin to you know, organically uh, spread the message to the rest of the organization. But a lot of times it starts with us and our yeah. willingness to take a risk and, and get out there and figure out how we add value and do things the right way. Yeah, I like that. Just, you know taking a risk, it's true. Um, and fear holds us back tremendously, holds people back from maybe taking that initiative, overcoming that fear and investing in themselves and, and taking the risk to take that responsibility and uh, deal with the outcomes. I mean, you know, when you take risks, there's always that higher potential to gain, but there is also the potential that you could fail. But as long as you learn from that failure and, and move forward, 
it, you, it's better than just uh, staying the status quo, I believe, you know. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. I worked as a senior project manager for one company. And uh, I had been with the company probably about three years. And I had a good reputation as far as being a project manager who could get things done. Uh, and the fellow who was the engineering manager, who was my boss, I, had, I was actually on vacation. I'd just gotten home on a Friday afternoon from vacation and I was out mowing my lawn. And my wife came out with the phone and said, hey, it's one of your fellow engineers from the company. And I said, gee, that's really funny because I usually don't get calls at home. So I got on the phone and it turned out it was a fellow named Kurt, who was one of my friends there. And I said, Kurt, what's going on? And he said, I just got word that Bob, the department manager, passed away. He was, uh, you know, he was on a, a cruise uh, and uh, he and his wife had dinner. She wanted to go to the show and he was tired and wanted to go down to the cabin and rest. And a few hours later, she found him. He'd had a heart attack and passed away. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, I said, well, well, we'll deal with it on Monday when I, you know, when I get in. And I went into work and it wasn't anything where I deliberately took over or anything like that, you know, but because of the reputation that I had as being a good project manager, other project managers in the business were coming to me and saying, you know, hey, what do you think we ought to do with this? You know, hey, can you give me a hand with this? Hey, can you give me some insight on, on how I should be approaching this thing? And that went on for about four or five months and we still didn't have a replacement for my boss. And one day the plant manager called me up and, and said, hey, can I talk to you before you go home tonight? And so I wandered into his office and he said, um, you want to take Bob's job? He said, you've been doing it for the last six months. You know, why, why don't you just move your office in there and, and take over? And so, you know, it's being willing to take the risk. It's being willing to step up and take the responsibility, you know, and if you have a good reputation to start with, that becomes a good building block to be able to, you know, to be able to have, you know, have further influence in the organization and, and move up and, and get more responsibility. Good point. Good story. Do you have, um, you know, maybe a, a story, success story you can tell us about a business, small business owner or medium-sized business owner that you worked with where you helped them transform from uh, living without a purpose in their business or perhaps personally as well? And what did that end up looking like after okay. you worked with them? Um there was one young woman I worked with, uh, probably, I want to say it was maybe six or seven years ago. I'd have, might have even been a little bit longer than that. And she was actually referred to me by another client of mine. And she had, um, she had a, a very successful career in corporate America and desperately wanted to own her own business. And so she stepped out of corporate America and started a home health care business. And she should have done better planning than she did. She gave herself a year. She had a year of finances uh, behind her to get this business started. And she was between eight and nine months into the process and things were not working at all. And so she was faced with, you know, gee, I've got another three months maybe that I, that I can afford to pay the bills. And if it doesn't work, I'm gonna have to shut down my business and go back to corporate America. And when, initially when I met with her, you know, I was talking with her about what's going on with your business, how are you approaching things, and just sort of the general business conversations that individuals like you and I who are coaches and consultants would have. And I finally looked at her and I said, Diane, let me ask you something. Why are you really doing this? I mean, it seems to me I'm, I'm having trouble crossing the bridge between being corporate America and running a small home health care business. I, you know, I'm having a whole lot of trouble getting across that bridge. I said, what is it that's driving you to do this? And she sat and she thought for a few minutes and she said, you know, she said, I think the thing that is really motivating me is that when my parents were elderly, my sisters and I constantly struggled with the fact that, you know, home health care was difficult to find and quality people were almost impossible to find. And so she said, I wanted to create an organization where the people who would be going into elderly people's homes would really have that heart for serving them. And it would almost be like their children were taking care of them, that we would take such good care of them. And I said, all right, let's harness that 
and figure out how to draw, how to use that as a driver in your business, because that's a great purpose to be of service to other people and to use the, the bad model that you had with your parents to create an even better model. And the other tweak that we made in the process was I said, okay, so how are you reaching your current client base? And she said, well, I'm going out and talking to elderly people. And I said, you've got the wrong target market here. You need to be talking to the elderly people's kids because in most cases, they're the ones who are holding the purse strings. And so with giving her a purpose and tweaking her marketing model just a little bit, and in the period of the next three or four years, she built a multi-million dollar business uh, you know, with a number of healthcare workers working for her. And uh, just within the past year and a half or so, she sold the business and retired to North Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the power of discovering your purpose and, and then ho harnessing, if you will, the horsepower that's required to, you know, to be able to be successful. You know, I was thinking while you were saying that, you know, you know the healthcare business, obviously, um, especially for elderly people uh, over the last 10 years has uh, skyrocketed, but you could still have a purpose and not execute right and not really take advantage of the timing of the market. What do you do when you discover your purpose, but your timing is wrong? You know, you, you just reach, you find the new purpose or do you find a specific niche where you could in that market? I, I think the I think that it really comes down to I mean if you have a purpose and that's convinced you've convinced yourself that that is what you have to do in life if there are no opportunities go create them find a way to creatively express that in a way that's going to uh, add enough value to the to the marketplace uh, for you to be able to exist I mean really when it comes right down to it when you look at uh, at the attainment of your purpose, you know, we need to look at what are the things that, that we're passionate about in life. We need to look at what skill sets and, and abilities have we accumulated over the years and how do we begin to combine those into something that can add value to our sphere of influence and then grow beyond that sphere of influence. Um, so I think that's, you know, you don't give up on it just because you might sit back and say, well, maybe the timing isn't exactly right. Well, go and create the timing. Um, and it takes hard work sometimes to be able to do that, but that's where having a coach who will ask you the right questions, becoming part of a mastermind group where you can tap into uh, successful business people who have been there and done it and can give you ideas about things. Uh, you know, you've got to open yourself up because I think part of the problem a lot of times, especially when you're dealing with entrepreneurial people, is they have a tremendously hard time letting go. So they'll start with something and they don't know everything and they can't know everything. Uh, but I've worked with a number of entrepreneurs over the years who have started businesses. And fortunately for them, they were in a point at a point where they said, you know, hey, I'm the creative guy here. You know, I'm the one who's coming up with the ideas. But when it comes to execution, I got no idea what I'm doing. I need to hire somebody to run the place because I, I'm not concrete sequential logical thinker like an engineer you know I, I don't I don't get excited about that. I want somebody else to worry about that um, you know and once so upon a time knowing yourself I, knowing your strengths and your weaknesses yeah knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and being, being uh, open and honest enough to being be able to admit that number one I don't know everything and number two I don't need to what I need to do is right. focus on surrounding myself with people who know the things that I don't know yeah, very true, very true. Okay, well, look, I think uh, we've covered pretty much everything I, I had to ask you regarding purpose and, and uh, business, uh, driving business success from a sense of purpose or a clarity of purpose. Um, anything that you feel you want to add that maybe I didn't ask at this point? No, I think we I think we talk about a lot of good stuff today, Stephen. And I would just yeah. uh, tell people don't, you know, purpose. I think sometimes is an overused word, and and uh -huh. it's also a misunderstood word. And uh -huh. just because it may not resonate with you initially, don't give up on it. Put it in the back of your mind and and turn it over and start thinking about why you're doing the things in life that you're doing. 
uh, yeah. and, and how you could have a greater impact and leave a greater legacy in this world. You know, and I think that if we can get more and more people to do that, ultimately uh, we'll wind up with a great group of servant leaders and the world will be a much better place. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's why I do what I do is uh, in great part is to contribute to making this world a better place and to, uh, you know, having happier people enjoying journey of life. That's, you know, that's really to me what the purpose is. So thank you, Gary. Um, I really appreciate you uh, joining me here today. And, and I think uh, you shared a lot of uh, valuable information. I'm just going to click into uh, gallery view here so we could both be up on screen. And um, if you want to, or people want to um, consult with you, I know that on your website, there's a free exploratory session that you offer. They could go to your website. Again, I'm put the link to that in the description of this video. Uh, and where can they buy your books? You have four uh, books. Uh, yeah, everything, uh, everything is on Amazon. Uh, if, they, uh, if they just search me out there, uh, they'll find they'll find it right there. Okay, and uh, they can see that also on your website. I guess there's a link. Yeah, there's a link right there. Right there. Okay, so you could either uh, speak to Gary through a free session or pick up one of his books. Uh, if you like this, please uh, give it a thumbs up. <laughs> uh, leave a comment. Also, uh, subscribe to my channel um, to get news of new videos, turn on notifications so you do get uh, news of those. Also, I offer uh, free downloads of forms, templates, and worksheets that you can get from my website, and the links to those are in the description of this video. Uh, there's also articles in the blog section of my website. And uh, thank you again, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk again soon.